Before I start this uh, lesson, which will be the first in a, a series, I want to mention what I have in mind. I thought about this for a while, and I thought, well, this is just a good way to do this as any. I want it to be for your benefit, of course. But I want to speak on the church you read about in your New Testament. Now, this is going to be, as I said, the first in a series. But I'm also presenting it so it can be, and it's recorded, viewed by people who are not members of the church, who don't understand what the Bible teaches about the Lord's church. So with that in mind, as we go through these studies over the next several weeks, we want to deal with the first installment in this series of studies. We're going to talk about a church today that is the Lord's church, and we will appeal to the Bible in general, and specifically the New Testament, because it is the last will and testament of Jesus Christ. Therein is the teaching that is proper about the church. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 makes it clear that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto every good work. Surely all those who want to know exactly about the church that Jesus built will know that the only infallible primary source from God to man teaching us about it is the Bible in general and specifically the New Testament of Jesus Christ. We're going to, in this first installment, notice one reason that all men ought to be a part of the church that Jesus built. I will refer to that church as the New Testament refers to it, as the church of Christ. And I will define that term as the New Testament defines it. Now, is that the only term of designation existent in the New Testament that references the church? Well, no, it is not. But when we read in Romans 16, verse 16, Paul writing by inspiration of the church at Rome, the churches of Christ salute you, then we know that's an inspired way, expression of referring to the church, the realm of the saved, and to the one who saved it, Jesus Christ, and the one who built it, Matthew 16 and verse 18. The church that in your own Bible you can read about. It began in Acts chapter 2. And as this series of studies goes on, we'll understand better about several of those things. Now, if you're not a member of the Church of Christ, as the Bible defines, explains being a member of the Church of Christ, but you are a member of another religious organization, then I simply challenge your mind and ask you why. Why are you a member of it? Is it because your dad or your mom or some family member were members or are members of it? Is it because it's the closest group, religious group, to your house? Maybe it's because you have a close friend that's a member of it. Or maybe, just maybe, it has the nicest building anywhere around you. Is it because its system of faith and practice, that is the church of which you are a member, does not disturb your way of life? In fact, what they teach makes you feel comfortable in whatever you're thinking or saying or doing. There is some reason or reasons that you are a member 
Or I might say to those who are not members, you're not a member of the church of which you're a part of or why you're not a part of it. Don't you think that if you claim God as your Father and Christ as your Savior, or if you at least verbally say such, you will admit it, you will confess it, that it's to the Bible and the Bible only that you want to go to learn about the church? There are some members of a church who are members, and they don't even know why, and if you were to ask them, it would sort of be like the wife who, in preparing a ham and cooking it, always cut off the shank portion or the end of the ham before putting it into the pan to cook it. Well, her husband noticed that uh, she was doing that, and she put the, he put the question to her about, well, why are you cutting off the end of the ham? And she thought for a moment and realized that's just the way she'd been taught to do it. So she said, well, my mama taught me, so I'll go to her because that's what she always did. So she went to her and posed that question. Why did you cut it off? And she was a bit perplexed and said, well, I don't know, but I'll go to your grandmother and ask her. The grandmother listened to the question. She said, well, the pan I had wasn't long enough for the ham so I just cut the end of it off to make it fit so from then on a tradition began and though they didn't know why they did it though they had pans plenty big enough to hold the whole thing they just cut the end of the ham off every time they cooked it and really did not know the reason why well, there are a lot of folks out there like that on a number of things if your member or your neighbor were to ask you, and I speak to my brethren, why you were a member of the Lord's church, the church of which you read about in the Bible. Could you give them a biblical reason? Or maybe you're just a member because you always cut the end of the ham off. I have long contended that a great many people are members of the Lord's church because that's the only church they ever knew. They never sat down and studied from the Scriptures and built their own faith on a thus saith the Lord proposition regarding anything they do religiously. It's just what they always did. Of course, when that happens for anybody, when trying times come, when sacrifices are called for, when pain is involved, they don't have their own personal faith. It's never been built up. They don't study the Bible like they ought to. They may admit it, but they don't change. Thus, they don't understand the church or anything about the church, especially why they're members of it and what they ought to be doing as a member. Well, we hope that in this series of studies that we'll see the reason to have the truth of God behind what we believe about the church of which we're a member. And that if we cannot find that church in the Bible, the infallible, the inerrant, the all-sufficient, final and complete revelation of God to man, James 1.25, that we will leave it and become a member of the church that Jesus built and shed His blood to purchase, that we will have that much concern. Now, if we lose you right here in this study, then all that indicates is you just don't see the need of getting that involved and who really cares? Well, I'll say this about that attitude. It's certainly characteristic of most in the United States when it comes to religion. But the majority rarely is right when it comes to religious matters. If our neighbor were to ask us about why we were members, would, would we call to mind immediately the inspired Peter's writing in 1 Peter 3.15, but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts. And be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you. Of course, that presupposes you do have the hope of heaven in you. And then he says, do it with meekness, an attitude of submission to properly constituted authority and fear, proper all reverence and fear of God. 
that shows you why a great many people are not trying to understand anything about religion in general, especially about what we know as Christianity, and specifically about the church revealed on the pages of the New Testament. If our neighbors were to say that one church is as good as another, how would we answer them? Or maybe you believe that. If you believe that, where did you learn it? Did you learn that from the word of Jesus Christ who built the church and who purchased it with his blood? Well, over the next several lessons, we're going to be looking at why you should be a member of the church of Christ. As that term, and I cannot overly emphasize this, is defined and used in the New Testament. Realizing there are other time, terms that show the relationship of the Savior to those He saved and of those saved to the one that saved them. Because you see, there is no proper name like your surname that's applied to the body of Christ. They're only scriptural terms of designation. Now, we'll say more about what I'm about to say in other lessons. But each member of the church has a proper name. And that's Christian, which simply means of Christ. And thus, when we speak of the church of Christ, we're talking about those who are of Christ, and we'll even be studying how they became of Christ, or have the right and the authority of Christ to wear His name. The first thing we're going to examine in this first lesson is that you should be a member of the Church of Christ because it was founded by the scriptural builder, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Now, there is no church that can be scriptural unless it was founded by the scriptural builder. So if you're a member of the church that was founded by someone else besides Jesus Christ, to begin with, in this very first lesson, you know that it's not the church that Jesus shed his blood to purchase, Acts 20, verse 28. And of course, the very fact that a religious body exists is proof that it was founded by someone, but the one that belongs to Jesus was founded by Jesus. So each group will either be scriptural or unscriptural, authorized by the New Testament or not authorized by the New Testament, acceptable to God or not acceptable to God. And we see, first of all, that to be acceptable to God, it must have a scriptural builder. But it can have, and maybe most do, possess unscriptural builders. We must know who the builder was of each religious organization to know if it's scriptural. Are you interested enough to know who built the church of which you are a member? Do you care? Well, I say again, as I said a moment ago, if you really don't care, why is it that you're doing anything you're doing religiously? If a church is founded by a scriptural builder, it's very simple to conclude that then it's scriptural. But if it's not founded by a scriptural builder, thus it's unscriptural, and it is not acceptable to God. This idea, it doesn't make any difference what you believe, just be sincere, doesn't work in any other phase of life. Yet it has been known among those churches we know as denominational churches for years and years. Now let me pause here and say, the church of which we're studying is not a denomination. If you read your Bible, and there, of course, really is where the problem actually is, someone reading and understanding the Bible to know the things of God, people don't do that much anymore. Or they study it for the wrong reason, just to justify what they already believe. But if you're studying your Bible, you'll know these particular things about the church. You'll know it's not one of many that are acceptable to God. 
Everything about the New Testament of Christ teaches about the church of Christ. And if I can refer to the New Testament of Christ, the last will and testament, where he manifests his will and the only place where his will is manifest, then I can speak of, as the Holy Spirit did through Paul in Romans 16, 16, churches of Christ. And that's what I do because I know in the Bible that's the way the realm of the, same is, of the saved is referred to. But when you look at division among those in Christ, Jesus himself prayed that those who believed on him through the apostles' word would be one even as he and his father are one. Does that describe denominationalism? Paul rebuked early forms of division in the church in 1 Corinthians 1.10 when he said God's people, members of the church, are to be of the same mind and the same judgment. That there should be no divisions among them. Now, I don't think that's hard to understand if you want to understand it. And if you don't want to understand it, there's no way it can be explained as to what it means. So you see, so much of our understanding of things is dependent upon our own attitude toward it. And if we try to approach God with, from the standpoint of saying, well, I'm going to justify everything I already believe, then if you find something in the Bible that goes against what you presently believe, you're not apt to believe the truth. Yet Jesus said in John 8, 31 and 32, If ye continue in my words, then are you my disciples indeed. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Are we willing to do that consistently and with regularity? I said earlier that Jesus Christ of Nazareth founded the scriptural church. Now if you turn to Matthew 16... The Apostle Matthew, writing by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, as did all the writers of the Bible, and as we noted a while ago in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, recorded an instance where the Lord was speaking to His apostles. And in Matthew 16, He asked, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they told him who different men said that he was. And, and you know, if you go to men today to study about the church, you'll get about the same kind of answers as was given by the apostles as to who the people of that day thought Jesus was. But then he asked them specifically, all right, you've told me what people think, but what do you think? Well, Peter spoke up and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Well, there was a blessing pronounced upon him by the Lord himself. And then he said, I will build my church. More about this later. Well, now Jesus either stated the truth, that he built his church. The word church is singular. C-H-U-R-C-H. Singular. I will build my church. Well, he either did or he didn't. Notice it is future tense. At the time he said this, he had not built it. But he says, I will build my church. Therefore, it's certain that no church can be scriptural unless it was founded or built by Jesus Christ. If a church was founded by John Calvin, Joseph Smith, or anybody else like that, then it is not scriptural. We emphasize that again. Jesus, in keeping with his promise to build the church, gave Peter the authority. And most religion today pays little attention to authority. It's all, if it feels good, do it. But nevertheless, he gave Peter, the Apostle Peter, the authority to state the terms of admission into the kingdom or church. Well, we've introduced the word kingdom here. We'll talk more about that in the later lesson. But you'll notice in Jesus' discussion with the apostles that he uses the word kingdom and church interchangeably as he speaks of the same institution. So Jesus, in keeping with his promise to build the church, gave Peter that authority. Authority for what? To state the terms of admission into the kingdom 
or church. And some people just say kingdom church, meaning the same thing. Now that brings up an interesting observation that we'll note here. One of the most interesting studies of the New Testament regarding the church that Jesus built is to note the different terms the Holy Spirit used to refer to the institution of the saved, the realm of the saved. And you'll find there are a number of different descriptive terms. The body of Christ, the church of God, the family of God, and so on. Again, showing, and for emphasis sake, that it's not a proper name. But it's a descriptive term, and there are several of them. If you look at Matthew 16 and verse 19, you see where the Lord told Peter that you'll have the terms of entrance. Keys the kingdom. A key unlocks something. A key usually unlocks a door. It permits, therefore, entrance into. It permits entrance into for the one who has the key and uses it as it ought to be used in a lock to unlock a door that allows you to enter in. So, and I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom. He's still speaking to Peter. And whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Now Colossians 3 and verse 17, Paul writing to the church at Colossae, he said, Whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. When you do something in the name of the state of Texas, it's by the authority of the state of Texas. And when you do something in the name of Jesus Christ, it's by the authority of Jesus Christ. Why, Jesus said himself in Matthew 28, All power or authority hath been given unto me in heaven and on earth. The Father gave him that authority. He himself said that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. John chapter 14, verse 6. Thus, when you read John 14 then chapter 15 and chapter 16, you see the Lord speaking to all of the apostles regarding their work as apostles of Christ. And he pretty well says the same thing to all of them that he said to Peter right here. And so you find on that first Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ at Jerusalem that on the apostles, after there was a sound of a rushing mighty wind it came down from heaven, no wind, but the sound of it filled all the house where they were sitting. Cloven tongues appeared unto them, the apostles, and they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And it says that Peter, standing up with the eleven, they were all preaching because they are the ambassadors of the court of heaven to earth. Through them, the King, Christ, reveals His will. And only through them, now, consider, we learned then that on that day, people heard the gospel preached in its fullness for the first time. But remember, they had been commanded to preach the gospel to every creature. Mark 16 in verse 15. We see also that they were commanded to baptize people who believed in Christ as the Son of God. Mark 15, verse 16. And we see up until Acts chapter 2 that the church is spoken of as that which was in the future. But from Acts chapter 2 on, it's spoken of as a present reality. And when you read Peter and the rest of the apostles standing up, they all preached the gospel and they preached it by a miracle in the languages of all the people that were there, their hometown languages, so that they would say, I hear we every man in our own tongues when we were born. These wonderful works of God. And proof was offered in the preaching of the word, the seed of the kingdom, Luke 8, 11. And thus, as they were pricked in their heart due to their recognition of their sins, and they were devout religious people, they were there to do what they knew God wanted them to do under the law of Moses. That they cried out unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Thus their believers, he took them as those who believe in Christ, for faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. And what had they heard? 
they had heard proof in the word of God that Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom they had crucified, had been raised from the dead to die no more. And through his authority, his remission of sins preached. Thus, as believers, they were told to repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Now, as you read on down through Acts chapter 2, you will see that the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Thus, we're back to where we started. Why do we refer and why do the scriptures refer to the institution or the body of the saved as the church of Christ? Why, it's one of the inspired terms that describes the saved to the Savior and the Lord added to the church. You see, you can't join the one worldwide body of Christ. But when you are baptized into Christ, Galatians 3.27, you are a part of the church of Christ taught in the New Testament of Christ. Thus, we're talking about the church as you read of it in the New Testament being the scriptural church. Now, in our day and time, it is almost um, impossible to get people to understand that. Good possibility, those who are listening intently, I hope, to this sermon can't even think of the church except you think of denominationalism where one church is a part of the whole. There's no teaching in the New Testament like that. And of course, if you don't believe me, I invite you to study it that diligently to find out. There was just one church that our Lord built, Matthew 16 18. It's His church. Acts 20 and 28 says He purchased it. It wears His name. He adds all those He saves to it and to no other church. He built the realm of the saved. Let us understand that it was not founded by John the Baptist. John was the forerunner of the Christ to the Jews. He preached a baptism of remission of sin or for the remission of sins, but it was a baptism of repentance. The Jews were already in covenant relationship through the law of Moses to God. But Paul tells us in Galatians 3.24, it was a schoolmaster to bring us unto Christ. John the Baptist, doing his work, said, When Christ came to his baptism, behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. He even denied that he was the Son of God or the Savior or the Messiah. But he came to get the Jews ready for the Savior. And thus they had to repent and believe his message. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. To be at hand is to be close by. And we've already seen the kingdom is the church and the church is the kingdom. So that's what John came to do. John, in fact, died before the church of Christ was ever established. He was a great man, Matthew eleven eleven. But Jesus said, at least in the kingdom is greater than John. So John was never in the kingdom, was he? Because he died before the kingdom or the church was ever established. Now, is it important that we study these things? Indeed it is. In Matthew 15, verse 13, Matthew by inspiration records our Lord saying, Every plant which my heavenly Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. Does that cause concern on your part as to what plant you are a part of? It ought to. Jesus said this, of course, during the time when the Jews approached God through the law of Moses. God, if you please planted the Hebrew religion. All other religions did not count while that's the way that the Jews approached God. But if God would uproot other religions in the time of the law of Moses for the Jews, then the principle is he'll do the same thing today under the Christian system. The Christian system, the gospel system, is superior to the law of Moses and God would not lower his standards. We noticed that earlier the foundation of the church is mentioned by Peter and that foundation is of extreme importance. If you're going to build something you must have a foundation and it must be a proper foundation. And no building can be stronger than the foundation on which it rests. No structure built of out of proportion to the foundation is going to last very long. A spiritual church is no exception. Its stability and benefits depend upon its foundation. 
a scriptural church then must have a scriptural foundation. Otherwise, it would not be scriptural. It would not be authorized by Christ. It's His church. So what's the foundation on which the scriptural church rests? Matthew 16, 18, again, it's built on the rock. You're taught by Roman Catholicism that that rock is Peter, who they claim to be the first pope. None of that's true. The Bible doesn't teach it. And if you don't believe it, all I can say is study it enough so you can learn better. The proper name, Peter, comes from the Greek word petros, but it means a pebble or a stone. When Christ said upon this rock, I will build my church, he was talking about what Peter confessed, that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And it comes from Petra. You don't have to know Greek to hear the difference in Petros and Petra, which means a ledge stone, a foundation stone. The stone on which the church was to rest was the truth Peter confessed, that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God, Matthew 16, 16. Thus, the church was not founded on the weakness of human flesh, but on the deity of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Now let's just notice a few verses here that deal with this. Paul, in writing the church at Corinth, in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 11, said clearly, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Then he said to the church in Ephesus, in Ephesians chapter 2, and verse 20, And are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, and then we see in Psalms 118, 22, why he wrote that. The psalmist, hundreds of years before Jesus walked this earth and before he established his church, the stone which the builders refused has become the head stone of the corner. In Matthew 21, verse 42, Jesus himself applied that prophet, prophecy to himself. And then Peter... It's the Apostle Peter, the same one the Lord was speaking to in Matthew 16, applied this same prophecy to Jesus. When Luke records in Acts 4.11, this is the stone which is set at naught of you builders, which is become the head of the corner. The sublime foundation that Christ is the Son of God has stood, does stand, and will continue to stand. All kinds of wicked and malicious combined attacks of the opposition have not been able to change that. All kinds of infidels and atheists and modernists and skeptics have raved and ranted, contradicted, but Christ remains the only begotten Son of the living God. This foundation may truly be compared to an anvil Maybe many of you have known this particular poem. It was written by John Clifford, who lived between 1836 and 1923. And it can be compared in the sense that the anvil wears out the hammers. And Clifford wrote the poem called The Anvil. It reads, Last eve I passed beside a blacksmith's door, and heard the anvil ring the vesper chime. Then, looking in, I saw upon the floor old hammers worn with beating years of time. How many anvils have you had, said I, to wear and batter all these hammers so? Just one, said he, and then with twinkling eye, the anvil wears out the hammers, you know. And so thought I, the anvil of God's word, for ages skeptics' blows have beat upon. Yet, though the noise of falling blows was heard, the anvil is unharmed, the hammer's gone. Thus I say, as I said in the beginning, to the Word of God we go for our authority concerning all things religious. Colossians 3.17 
Jesus said, He that rejecteth me and receiveth not my word hath one that judgeth him. The words that I have spoken, the same shall judge him in the last day. John 12, 48. No wonder then that Paul told the young preacher Timothy, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, <coughs> rightly dividing the word of truth. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. It's called the perfect law of liberty. It's complete wherein God sent it to enlighten us on all things religious. But our topic today has to do with the church that Jesus built. And therein you will find the answer. Did Jesus build the church of which you are a member? Or if you're not a member of any church, then look for the one that Jesus built. I close simply with this. Simply because a church has the name Church of Christ above the door, out on the marquee, or on some sort of sign does not necessarily mean, I am sad to say, that it is the church of which you read out of the New Testament. It must bear the identifying marks. Not one, but the New Testament identifying marks of the church. If the enemies of our Lord could identify Christ to take Him in hand and crucify Him, and if the enemies found the church of the first century, and you can read that in your Bible, for they did, to persecute it, then those who want to know the church that Jesus built and purchased with His blood can find it in the proper study of the New Testament. And you can be a member of it. By believing with all your heart that Jesus Christ of Nazareth is the Son of God, for Jesus said, If you believe not that I am He, you shall die in your sin. But nowhere does the New Testament teach salvation by faith only. John 8, verse 24. Read James chapter 2. Then you're to repent of your sins, Acts 17, 30. Confess your faith in the Christ that He is the Son of God, Romans 10, 10. Complete your obedience to the gospel in order to become a Christian, as the Bible defines Christian, by being immersed in water by the authority of Christ into the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to obtain the remission of forgiveness of sins. If you do that, the Lord will add you to the church that He built because that's what he did, and the Word of God assures us he'll do the same for all those who want to become Christians. Nothing more, nothing less, nothing else. Members of the church of which you read about in the New Testament. If as a child of God you sin, you need to repent of those sins and confess them to God. We urge you to do so. And obey the truth, whatever your need, while together we stand and sing.